All right, should we go? Sure. We are rolling, I believe. I push the button. The, the light is on. You You're can good. see the light. I see the light. Go to the light. All right, what are we doing? That gets my goat. I thought we had retired that. Hi, everybody. This is Big Anklevich. And this is really awesome. awesome. And uh, welcome to another episode of That, that Gets My, my Goat. Yeah, well, I mean, we did do uh, our little uh, oh, yeah, February, February episode. episode. But before that, yeah, it seems like it would have been months. Wait, wait, hold on a second, man. Hmm? I think there might be something wrong with your mic. Oh. oh. How's that? <laughs> That's a big improvement. Oh, okay. I can really understand you better. Thanks for fixing that. Oh, well, you, anything I can do for for our fan. <laughs> for the threes of people listening. <laughs> that, that joke never gets old to me. Yeah, it doesn't. Why? Just like Ryan Gosling in The Notebook never gets old to me. I hear you. Did I say that out loud? Oh. <laughs> Okay, so yeah, uh, we used to do these episodes all the freaking time until one of us burned out, and then <laughs> we just took a break. And now it sounds like maybe we're going to pick up again, but I don't think they'll ever go back to the way they were. Quality, you mean? Never going back to that. <laughs> they used to have a uh, just a high level of quality, and we're not going back to that, folks. We're going to stick with this shit. Along the... Oh, hey. <laughs> An explicit warning. That's right. Um, next, you're going to make that queef on a yoga ball joke, since we can say what we want on this show. Yeah, nobody's um, listening. I got an email from the Parsec Award Chair Council Table uh -huh. Reich, and they said that they're not going to be doing it at Dragon Con anymore. They're going to do it online. They're going to do a virtual Parsec I thought they were just asking whether people thought that would be okay. They were. Had they but decided? It, but when I went to the site to vote, it looked like, yeah, it was all but set in stone there. Right? Oh, yeah. Well, that's kind of sad because we never got to go to one of them. But I don't think we ever would have gone. I mean, it's in Atlanta, right? Yeah. Am I saying that right? Yeah. In Atlanta. Did I mean say it better? Uh, Atlanta. Atlanta. There you go. <laughs> yeah, it's in Atlanta, which is quite a ways from us. But uh, you never know how things might change. But um, anyhow, when you mentioned, like, the show's never going to be quality again, <laughs> I thought about that. I thought about the Parsec Awards. And, like, every other year we will get excited and try and get a nomination. Or, this or is award. one of those years, by and the way. And this is the odd year when we will, yeah. This year doesn't quite count. This is what I want to do with this year. And I, I started getting this feeling the last, I don't know, a week or something like that. Okay. I saw... Somewhere, Maybe it was just you were asking about, because we went, what we're going to talk about a little bit today is a uh, ex our experience at the Writers' Conference that we go to every February. One of the guests at the Writers' Conference was Mary Robinette Kowal. Yes! Uh, you texted me at one point and asked me if she had Hugos. Right, because she said, uh, she she kept joking about... All of the celebrities that she had met, and you know, it was like I was talking to Ursula the other day. Uh, that's Ursula Le Guin, and I was on a panel with uh, George Martin the other day. And I said to George, and I was like, "Holy crap!" And then later in the panel, she said, "I'm trying to think of what what the context was." She's like, "I think I know what I'm talking about. I've won a bunch of Hugos after all." But, and I thought she was just joking. That same silly, you know, Ursula kind of. That's how you name drop thing. And so I texted you and I said. Has Mary Robinette Cole won a bunch of Hugos? I looked it up to see, and yeah, she's won like four of them. She's won like one for short story, one for uh, novella or novelette or something. She won one for Writing Excuses podcast. I think she won the Campbell Award, which I believe is the best new writer, Holy which they shit. give out at the Hugo ceremony, but it's not actually a Hugo Award because it's the Campbell Award, which is... <laughs> Not Hugo. But anyways, for some reason looking that up, I thought Writing Excuses won a Hugo for like the best podcast. Because that's a new category that they have created since we started our show. Since 
actually there was that time when Starship Sofa did this big drive to try and get a podcast, to, well, to get their podcast to win a Hugo. <sighs> You know, obviously they wanted a Hugo, but also I think it was kind of a let's kick down the doors and and make them know that podcasts exist and, you know, acknowledge us, which worked because now they're like, oh, crap, well, we need to make a podcast category. So this doesn't happen again. And so now there's a podcast category. And I thought, you know what? I want (laughs) to try and get that. A Hugo? Yes. Not a Parsec. Not a Parsec. I mean, oh, yeah, it's a Parsec, too. But a Hugo. I want to try and get a Hugo. Now... I know that we don't deserve a Hugo for last year. I would feel embarrassed to ask people to vote for us to have a Hugo for what we did last year. But we will have had three times as many 2016, that gets my goats, than we will in in 2017. Possibly. Three times. Possibly, but I I expect the main show to be the one that wins the Hugo. Not that that gets my goat. But I want to. I'm going to push for us to do as great as we can be for our show this upcoming year. Which you know we've already got a plan. We've looked at it. We've scheduled stuff, and we expect to do more this year, anyways. Shoot, we've got like three or four episodes, 75 percent done when it comes down to it. So we're really close already. And so the other thing is, I think that Worldcon is in like Helsinki, Finland, or something like that. Okay. This year. <laughs> Whereas next year it's in San Jose, California. So if we got nominated for a Hugo next year, we could attend. Uh, where is San Jose? You don't know the way to San Jose? Damn it, I was going to make that same joke. Oh, well, uh, <laughs> I don't know how the song goes after that, if they actually give you directions. But yeah, you, you just go to the Bay Area and it's right there. Anyways, so we could go to it. So that's uh, plus number two. So that's what I'm saying. We we push for for Hugo. So hopefully, folks, we will uh, earn your respect over the next year to where you would vote for us for the Hugo, and then we're going to beg and grovel and plead for it. Well, I probably will. I think Rish will be too embarrassed to do so, but I will. I have no shame. Well, at least when it comes to begging for Hugo, I do have sh- other issues. But along those lines, you having no shame. That was something that they really banged the drum a lot about at this writers' conference: is Having pimping no your stuff and being endlessly uh, exuberant about what you've written and getting it out there and sharing it with everybody and resharing it and reminding and tweeting and, and having your brand and pimping your. That was one that I went to. I went to one that was actually called Pimp Shameless Self Promotion. Oh wow! And they talked about having a brand. Unfortunately, the people who ran the thing were like a couple of non-fiction writers mm. slash they wrote activists. Slash fiction? No, no. Oh, activists. Okay. They were not. They were. They were barely writers, to tell you the truth. <laughs> they did other things, but they I had want, also written a book. I want that to say, say that on my headstone? Yeah. Rashad Field barely, barely a, a writer. writer. But yeah, they were like, "Oh, you need to def- you they wanted you to come up with a mission statement for your life." Basically like your plot, your pitch, your log line that you would pitch to somebody for your story. They wanted you to come up with something like that for your life, and that would be your brand and everything that you would do on social media would have to do with that. I don't understand I, that at all. I was not a fan of it. I'll have to admit I I wished I hadn't gone to the stupid panel cuz it felt I, I almost felt like it was at like an Amway meeting or a multi-level some, yeah, meeting. some kind of crap like that or that I somehow stumbled into like the Deepak Chopra panel by mistake or the you know, Joel Osteen. <laughs> just oh, is one that Osteen of those or Osteen? I don't know how you say his name. You will. But just <laughs> just one of those places where you know it's all like y- y- I'm good enough, I'm smart enough. And I have a brand for my life. Now, that's interesting. You and I both, we went to a number of panels where afterward I was like, yep, I would have been better off not going to that one. (laughs) Um, See, because I really tried this year to go to as many panels as I possibly could. So I'd go to the very first one in the morning all the way until... I couldn't stand it anymore. (laughs) I wanted to say all the way until the very last panel, but there were a couple of nights when I was like, yeah, I 
I'm just not going to be awake during this next one. And yeah, there were times when there'd be so many panels at the same time that I was like, oh, this one looks good. And this one, oh, gosh. And then there were other times when yeah, it was like, like, okay, yeah, I guess we could do this one. lesser of two, three, four <laughs> evils. Uh, and yeah, there were times when I definitely chose wrong, either because I misunderstood what the panel was about or just because like it didn't year, happen to be a good panel. What was that one you did last year where it was alien, like, romance? Inhuman, <laughs> in, inhuman romance. And like you thought, cool. okay, this is a sci-fi panel about, oh, this will be good. And then you go, no, it's a romance panel. About, about women having, having sex with alligators sex and stuff, with... yeah. <laughs> or sorry, not having sex, but falling in love with alligators. Oh. And, and having a romance and then the two of them... Swim off in the swamp together at the end. <laughs> Roll credits. But the other yeah, times you're yeah, you can be led astray by what. And there was one like that this year where I looked at it and I thought it said sci-fi and fantasy in romance or something like that or with romance. I think is what it was. And I thought, okay, so is this a romance panel that talks about how to include sci-fi in your romance or is it a sci-fi panel that talks about how to get romance in your sci-fi because there's a big difference between the two definitely and i'm not gonna i don't know maybe maybe that's what i need to do maybe i would sell a billion books if i just started writing romance instead (laughs) i guess i would have to read romance to have any idea what well anytime you go to one of those panels there, and there are not a lot of guys in the crowd. And on the panels, there's not a lot of guys on the panels. Whereas, like, I went to one about action scenes and one a couple about horror, and that tended to be the opposite. You right. Know, there, maybe there's a woman on the panel, but mostly it's, you know, a bunch of long-haired, bearded guys. <laughs> yeah, I just wonder what sells more. I get the feeling that romance sells way more than you saw. You could write really shitty romances and probably sell a lot. Whereas... I sense a dare coming on. Whereas you write really shitty sci-fi and people will be like, dude, that's shitty. I'm not... I'm never reading another one of your books. (sighs) You better write everything under a pseudonym. And if if I find out that that pseudonym belongs to you, I won't... I will spread it around and get you blacklisted because your shit sucks. Jeez. Oh, um, it's just less forgiving, I think. And I think in general, you know, people that read often are much more likely to be women. I think the skew is something like 80-20 or even 90-10. It's like the opposite of people who watch football or something kind of a thing. This is more off the subject, but sometimes that makes me think when I'm planning out a novel. I have ideas and I think, okay, well, this guy's going to be the main character. And then I think, oh, wait, should it be this girl is the main character? And some stories you can do that with. Other ones, you can't just swap the genders and and, and it still works. But uh, sometimes, yeah. The fact that all the books that you hear about that sell a ton these days, the Twilights and the Divergence and the Hunger Gameses, all these things that they're only one of. Little but Angel I'm, Helpers. <laughs> all the things that there's only one of, but I'm putting S's on to the end of it anyways. Uh, yeah, those are all female uh, main characters, so I wonder. Although, can you get away with that? I mean, I've told the story before of my wife who doesn't like to read books by male authors who are writing female characters because they don't seem genuine to her. And, yeah, could I get away with that? I know we've talked about how it's... Sometimes we try it just to see if we can do it. And it's kind of a struggle and a stretch and a reach for us to try and write a female character. And how well did we do? (laughs) Anyways, back to the subject at hand. Forget all my sidetracking and tangents. It's fine. I I went to a panel that was about uh, dealing with writer angst. You know, like the inner voice saying you're not good enough or that you're a failure. Or Or that you need to write female characters instead of males. Well, that's going hand in hand with that. And (laughs) Yeah, there were maybe... 35 to 40 
people sitting in the audience, and four of them were male. I asked you about that, and I said, do women just have more angst or deal with more angst as writers than men do? And do you remember what you said? Um, you said, women are writers because men don't read, is what you said. <laughs> and I was just like, okay, that's fair. But yeah, they, I, I tried to go to a bunch of different panels with different topics and all that, not just go to the stuff that seems like it would be the most fun. Because in the past, that's that was my priority. It's like, oh, this will be really fun. Oh, this one's going to be funny. I was like, oh, yeah, this is a subject I already know all about, so I can't <laughs> wait to go. So this time I tried to go to things that would be helpful. And, yeah, there were one or two panels that I went to because they sounded like fun, uh, including one of those where I was just like, well, I should not have gone to this one. <laughs> but, you know, stuff about being a full-time writer versus a part-time writer, stuff about self-promotion, self, self-publishing, self yeah, whether you wanted to... Uh, write it as a short story or as a novel, that kind of stuff. And I didn't learn a ton in most of the panels, but just hearing from people that are making it happen, that are actually doing it, that are writing all the time or publishing all the time or selling books all the time, it's encouraging, it's inspiring. It makes me think, you know, I can do that. I, I could grow a beard. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, even though I didn't feel like I got that much new stuff out of this this conference, I still got that surge of energy and, and excitement and adrenaline, motivation to go out and put out more, to write more, or do better than I, than I have been. So really, you know, it's, that's worth the price of admission to me was right there. Yeah, that's really all I was after going to this as well. There were several times where I was just like, yeah, I'll just go to whatever panel that Rish is going to because I don't really care right now none of these things look all that awesome and I know that I'm not at, at the level that I, I should be most of the people that are attending this conference already write every day they already have been doing this for probably years you know they've probably written like five novels already and those are like the, the newest of the newbies there are the ones that did that <laughs> and oh so I feel like a lot of this stuff that I'm hearing, I, well, I, and a lot of it is, this will make your book good, right? Do, use these things in your novel and it will be good. And that's good for me now. And other things are, yeah, when you publish, you got to do this and this and this and this. And I'm like, I don't have a book to publish yet. I've only written short stories and half of them I hate. So I know that there's going to be a bunch of, you know, panels that I'm going to go to and hear stuff. And by the time I could actually use the info, I will have forgotten it because it'll be like three years down the line or whatever. But yeah, the main thing that I wanted was just, yeah, that kind of boost. You know, you can do this kind of feeling, go for it and really put in the work. This time around, as opposed to last year, last year I was in the middle of like my worst writing phase of my life where I just hadn't written forever and I didn't want to write and I was like consciously avoiding it and all that kind of stuff whereas this year that's over and I'm actually in the best spirits and the best uh, work ethic or whatever of writing that I have been in like five years and I feel great and I'm really excited about it and so I was already excited just going to it in the first place. I could have just skipped it completely and been fine <laughs> and not needed that boost because I was already there. But going, I, I got just a little bit more boost. It was great. I, I went to various panels, some of them that were really good, a few of them that were stinkers. I even got some uh, some writing done in one of the panels that was crap. I brought my little wireless keyboard along and... Uh, paired it up with my phone so that I could just write onto my phone and I wrote 250 words in Sunny and Gray while I was sitting in a panel in which there was a bunch of police officers who were talking about you know make sure you get the police work right and they talked for like five minutes about how too many TV shows uh, really suck with their you know police procedural stuff 
And then the entire rest of the panel was just authors saying, uh, I'm writing a, a story like this, and I was wondering which kind of bullets the officers use in their service revolvers. Or what, you know, it was just like questions that were important to that particular person. <laughs> but everybody else in the audience was just like, no, hey, no, call on me. Or they were like, oh, God, how, how do I get out of here? If I slip out, will they say something? Uh, sucks. <laughs> See, that that happens always. And I've gone to so many Q&As. I, I have to have gone to 70 or maybe even 100 Q&As now in my life. And the thing that used to bother me so much is when people would say, Hey, thank you for coming. And I really appreciate that you would come. And, you know, I've really liked your stuff or, or the, you know, what you did or was inspiring or you're so pretty. I have a question. And I would always just be so angry because I was like, you know what? You ate 40 seconds up with nothing <laughs> just now. Anytime somebody said, I have a question, I want to kick him in the face. And, yeah, that sort of crap happens all the time where somebody has like a spe very specific to them question you know uh -huh. to what they're working on and all that and there was one panel where there was a guy that says you know we're going to open this up to questions but please don't make a whole production of it don't eat up a ton of time with your question and don't don't make a statement or give us your opinion just ask the question and yeah there was a guy that that stood up and said well hey i it sounded like when you were talking about so and so and this that you were referring to us but and and the Moderator interrupted him and said, that sounds like a comment, sir. Is this a comment or a question? I mean, he was a super asshole about it. <laughs> where it was just like, whoa, he's, he's going to try and have us turn on this guy and boo him. Whoa, I, I don't know that I'm uh, uh, comfortable with that. <laughs> it's it's Shardimus Prime standing up once again. All, And so, yeah, I guess if I were on a panel, I might become that asshole where it's just like... I, I have a question. Yeah, you're standing at the microphone for a Q&A. <laughs> I don't know. See, I would be more worried if I was up there on the panel, if that anybody would actually... I'd be like, please, somebody stand up and ask a question. Oh, come... No. I don't want it to be like just the quiet room as everybody <laughs> just sits in and I go, Any, anybody got a question? <laughs> Anyone? No? There was. Oh, uh, well, I guess I'll let everybody. Go. I haven't been. <laughs> yeah, I haven't been to as many Q and As as you. I have been to a lot of T and As. Oh, but well, that's uh, true. I'm, those, I am sorely lacking in that area. <laughs> those I've found much more <laughs> enjoyable. But speaking of Q and As, one of the things that I thought was interesting, and I've told this story on that gets my goat years ago. Uh -oh. One time, I was at my friend's fortieth birthday party. And at this 40th birthday party, some chick, who I don't think was actually even, like, a Invited. friend of my friend. Like, somebody that he knew also knew her and brought her along or some. I don't She I don't was a know. plus one. Something, yeah, something like that. Okay. So she was there, and she was like, oh, yes, I'm an author, and I write these books, and man, man, man. And I was like, and my wife. Oh, wait, she, wait, sorry. She said this to you, or she said, she said this, this to, to anyone who talked to her? Oh, okay. And so my wife's like, oh, you should talk to my husband. He's, he likes to write, too. You should go. And so I talked to her for a little while, and uh, she told me all the stuff. And she's like, yeah, I write romances where I take Jane Austen plots and then change them around so that they're set in modern high schools. It's called Pride, Prejudice, and Lockers. Or I don't even know what they were called, but she immediately I was like, oh, fuck you. How do I get away? I, 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 need to, I don't care that my friend is 40. I've, I need to leave. Because I hate that stuff. I hate it too. But, but, anyways, but, but sorry, I got to okay. interrupt. You hate Pride and Prejudice and Lockers? Or you hate people that are are self-absorbed and talking about themselves like that? I'm talking Pride, Prejudice, and Lockers okay. particularly. I can understand it. This, I, this woman was California. I'm not going to say what her name was because I don't want to give her any press. Brinley. Yeah, we'll say her name was Brinley Brielle. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. <laughs> I want to like you. Come on. Yeah, so she started talking about all this stuff. And then we went to this weekend's conference, 
and I was looking through the panels and twice ah! on the schedule I saw this woman's name. She was a person presenting a panel and one of them was simply her name, ask me anything Q&A session. And I thought, really? Wait, just her? Just her, ask She's me anything. She's that big a deal? I didn't think so. Because you'd have to be a Harlan Ellison, ask me anything. <laughs> I'm not kidding, man. Well, to a do, I have a whole hour where it's just that person as a cue. They're not even doing a presentation. They're just going to answer questions from their fans. Yeah, that's what that's it, like J.K. Rowling material. <laughs> Seriously, and I was kind of amazed. I didn't go to either of her panels because I wasn't interested. I'll, I, I sort of was though, because like one of the, her first panel which was actually the 9 a.m. one. And I didn't make it there until like 9.45. Mm. And so I didn't go to anything at the 9 a.m. hour. But her 9 a.m. panel was making a living as a True. self-published writer. I think See, that would have been a good panel, yeah, despite th- Brinley Briel. Yeah, this is, despite Brinley Briel being the, the author, I was interested to hear what she might have to say, but I'd already listened to her, and she's... She was California Brinley Brielle. I mean, she <laughs> pimped herself. I mean, she was just at some party, and she was just like, oh, yeah, and you should do this. But she was also really encouraging, and she was kind of nice, and I was saying, oh, yeah, you know, I'd like to. I just can't make myself right. And she's like, oh, just do it. You can do it. Make yourself do it for, like, you know, 30 minutes or whatever. Well, this is a new side to Brindley Brojangles that I'm not. <laughs> you never told me that she was all encouraging. She was. Did, did she touch it? She, even like by accident, she's sort of. <laughs> she might have brushed against okay. it. Okay. Well, a then little. maybe I've had a, the wrong opinion about this person. <laughs> she was encouraging as far as that went. So I really, if it weren't for the pride, prejudice, and lockers uh, angle, I might have had reason to not despise her. But let's come up with like two or three more. <laughs> Uh, Jane Austen novels titles that are just absolute shite. I'll, I'll go first. Sense, sensibility, and midterms. <laughs> Your turn? There's some kind of Abbey. What was the Abbey one? I'm sure I don't know. Emma is too hard to do because it's just a name. I was going to say Wood Shop Emma. You're like, what? You didn't even try. <laughs> I don't have to try. I've got a whole Q&A just for me and my legion of fans and standing room only. It took 12 minutes just to hand the microphone around. Cheerleader Captain Emma. What, what are some of her other ones? She has... Persuasion. See, those single word ones don't work. Crystal blue persuasion. The single word ones don't work because the persuasion and... I can't believe we're talking about Jane Austen. Yeah, let's move on. Why? <sighs> Sorry. Why did you do that? Anyways, yeah. So she like had a her scab, own Q&A and I just kept scratching at it. And uh, she was, she was. I don't know if she was interesting or not. Another weird thing too was that one of my old neighbors from before we moved down the street. So now she's still my neighbor, but now a further down the street neighbor. Anyways, she also had a space on a panel. One of the. Th- the things that I thought as I saw that was, why aren't we on a panel? Why did I pay to get into this thing? One of the things that, that they had there was a episode, they did like a live episode of Writing Excuses Podcast. And I'm sure that they have way more listeners than we do. Well, the parsecs. We've lost a parsec to Writing Excuses, haven't we? Probably. But... We could totally do a live episode of the Dune, Steve, and... We have, sir. Right. We have at other conferences. So why didn't we do it here? Why didn't we just get in free and do that? I remember one time we went to the Comic-Con, and you were sitting there in one of them, and you had this, like, weird feeling of, someday I'm going to be on one of these panels. And then a couple years later, we were on the New Media Expo two years in a row. I don't know why we would ever go to a pa- to a conference without just calling them up and saying, "Hey, you want to do a panel with us?" And they would be like, "Sure, yeah, you could have this room." I mean, there's nothing playing here at this time anyway, so why not? Oh, I was going to say that should be a goal for next year, but it still can. We could make it work. Well, I couldn't help but feel like, well, I'm not as successful as these people on the panel, sure. or I'm 
I'm not as knowledgeable as the people on the panel. I don't have as much life experience as these people on the panel. But I went to a panel that was about horror, and one of the panelists said, you know what movie made Steven Spielberg famous? And I, I thought that he would say, you know, it's not Jaws, it's Duel. So I raised my hand and said, Duel? And he goes, no. And so somebody else said, well, Jaws. And he goes, no, Poltergeist. Poltergeist put Steven Spielberg on the map. And I was just like, Jesus, dude, that was 10 years after Duel. Poltergeist, would, I mean, he'd already made Raiders of the Lost Ark when that guy, what? And so all of the guy's credibility was gone. I was just like, dude, I, I don't think I need to listen to any of the rest of the stuff you say. You just stand up and walk out right then. I, well, I wanted to because that's just not a... It's like, why am I here? I know way more about it than you. Yeah, that's... My impression was that, yeah, I didn't deserve to be on a panel. I'm not as good as these people. Uh, but then when somebody says something like that, where it's just like, huh, boy, he sounds so confident and he's so wrong. <laughs> I'm sure there are p subjects that you don't know as much as the people that are up there. And there are life experiences that you didn't have that these people had that they have more of it. And I was saying this to you that day. I had a friend at work. He started asking me. He's like, I was, me and some friends were thinking it would be cool to like do a podcast. How did you start your podcast? And I stood there and talked to him about podcasts for 30 minutes just about oh you you got to get this and you got to do this and you should do this and this is how you should start and you want to do this first and then eventually you can move up to this but you totally got to do this and see how much you like it first and see whether it's going to be worth it you know and it just went on and on for just a half an hour just at the drop of a hat and so I can guarantee you if we wanted to do a beginning podcasting panel we could easily do that without preparing a thing. And <laughs> I'm sure there's all sorts of other things that uh, we could do similarly. And you were saying that you saw a panel that was about making your own audiobooks. And you were just like, why am why I, am not, I on not on that panel? panel? Yeah. And yeah, there's all sorts of things that we could do that with, that we should do that with. I think, unfortunately, California Rish is not the go to personality of Rish Outfield. <laughs> But he needs to force his way to the top a little more often and beat down the what if they don't like it? What if they say I got no future? I don't think I could handle that kind of rejection, Rish. Well, one of the panels that I went to was dealing with rejection and professional jealousy. And really, those two should have been two different panels because all we talked about was rejection. And then it was like, oh, there's five minutes left. OK, let's quickly go over professional jealousy. And that's an interesting topic, too, because like there was a lady who has been a writer for 23 years or something like that. And her friend says, oh, I'd like to write, too. Can I send you my manuscript and you give me your notes on it? And she's like, yeah, sure. That sounds like that sounds great. I'll help you in any way that I can. She gave her all these notes. The woman incorporated her notes, self-published, and she makes $20,000 a month on the one book she has published. And it, you could tell it just ate this woman up inside. I was just like, wow, this this would be a great hour-long panel just to hear stories like that and how you deal with it. Because there was no closure on how you deal with it. It's just, this is a she thing. This told is that what story and said, okay, well, uh, you got to figure that out. See ya. Yeah, now I'm going to go drink <laughs> Drano, guys. I'll see you later. Yeah, there's a guy, the guy that did the panel two years ago that so inspired me of, you can write a novel in three months, was on that same panel. And he said that he wallpapers his office with his rejection notes. He's like, they just cover in an entire wall. If ever that wall is full, I'll just start from the corner with that first rejection again and paste over it and just keep going. And I was just like, wow, that guy has stones of iron, man. That guy is so cool. But later he was talking about it and he says, you know, every time I get a rejection, every time I send somebody a submission and they don't accept it, it hurts as bad as it did the first time. And I interrupted the fudgin panel. I was just, whoa, 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 Johnny. Why would you wallpaper your wall with them then? I, I don't understand. And he's like, part of it is masochism, I guess. But the other part is 
you know, just look at this giant, well, look what I have created. Look how hard I have tried. It gives me a feeling of accomplishment to look at that wall and say every single one of these letters represents something that I worked on of me putting myself out there, even though it was hard for me. And that just blew me away because you know that guy. He seems super confident. In fact, he's probably the guy I go to in my head whenever I talk about these guys that says, I've written this book and it's called Brinley Briel and Lockers, and it will change <laughs> your life. And you need to buy it. And uh, here's a card. Anybody that wants to uh, buy that book, here's a card you can use as a bookmark for Brindley Brielle and Lockers. That, in my mind, is the idea of one of these authors, these self-serving, full-of-themselves authors. Not Maybe full-of-themselves is too negative, but they believe in Confident. their product. They believe in their own thing. They believe that you would like it as much as they do. And to hear him say that just floored me because it made me think maybe that is a persona that he puts on. Maybe he doesn't feel that way at all. Maybe he struggles with feelings of worthlessness and imposter syndrome and stuff the same as I do. But he's just really, really good at hiding it and putting on this author hat where suddenly he's Mr. Personality and everything that he touches turns to gold. Yeah, that I've told you one of the books that I read long ago was a Tobias Bakel story. Tobias Bakel. Tobias Bakel. <laughs> did uh, he write Anachoinosis? Yes, he did. Oh, still uh, the greatest episode of the Dune Steve ever done. Tobias Bakel wrote a you know how, basically sort of a memoir, sort of a how to be a writer kind of a thing. And yeah, that was one of the things that he said is that. You know, he had no control over whether people would accept his story or reject his story. The only thing he had control over was whether he submitted it or didn't. And so his goal was to get a hundred rejection letters. Because if he got a hundred rejection letters, that meant he sent it out a hundred places. Or, you know, I'm mean, not, not, not talking about a single story here, but, you know, over the space of a year, he wanted a hundred rejection letters, which, which means that he sent out stories to a hundred different places. He's putting his stuff out there. He's, he's hustling. He's doing his thing. And I tried to emulate that. I remember making a little binder that I was going to keep all my rejection letters in. And you saw that and went, why would you save them? <laughs> um... For potential revenge in the future. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I thought I thought that would. Be, and I never continued to follow through with it because I haven't ever done that with anything. But it, it seems like a good thing to do. You know, you just you gotta hustle. You gotta do your work, and that's the only thing that you can be in control of. You can't be in control of whether someone accepts it or not. You can only be in control of whether they see it. He got a hundred rejection letters but he also got some that were you know exception acceptance letters so you know there was that as well but it is hard yeah i don't know that's one of the things uh you got to get yourself to a certain level before you want to start just putting your stuff out there i mean nowadays you can just self-publish you know that's awesome because a you get more of a percentage of the profits so you don't have to sell as much uh, as you used to have to, to be able to make a living off of it. You know, you get way more of the money that you you get, and, and you know, the fat cat publishers aren't rolling in your money. You get to roll in your money. But now you don't have necessarily a gatekeeper who tells you, hey, no, sorry, you're not ready yet. You need to go back and keep trying until you've made it to the level of readiness that uh, should be required for you to start publishing stuff because the yeah that's the last thing you want to do is start publishing stuff and people reading go oh wow this is awful because they're not coming back they're not going to buy another book so <laughs> it's one of those things you got to worry about is have you made it to that level and how much you know what are you going to do are you going to still try to publish stuff in the traditional manner or just go straight for the self-publishing thing and just pray that you think you're good enough and you were right. Uh, that's one of those things that's hard for me to know 
have I made it to the level where I can just write something and put it out there? I don't know. I haven't written a full-length novel yet. And the one that I'm in the middle of writing seems to defy all the rules of what everybody said that I needed to do at the writers' conference this weekend. They all said, oh yeah, you gotta follow. You need this structure, you need this kind of stuff. You don't wanna bore people off the start. You gotta get to your story quick. You can't just have a boy meet a fairy and then develop a relationship for years and years before the story even starts to happen. <laughs> Boy, that seems like an awful specific thing <laughs> yeah. for somebody to say in that panel. <laughs> was that weird. by any chance Brindley Briel that Brindley Briel that said yeah. that? It was my mental Brindley Briel who mm. said that. I don't know. I'm afraid of that. I'm afraid because the book that I'm writing doesn't follow that typical three act structure kind of a thing with the normal, you know, the, a threat that appears, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's a very different structure. That and the other thing is that, you know, I worry about my choice of endings. Everybody complains about them and I wonder if I need to start changing things and really work on finding a way to make the ending different. It's funny because I told my daughter the ending of Sunny and Grey this weekend and I said, yeah, now I feel like I need to change it. And she said, no, don't do it. It has to end that way. Cool. I don't know why she said that, <laughs> but... From the mouths of... Is your daughter a babe? Yeah, some people probably think that. I, I usually don't look at my daughters that way, because that's kind of creepy. But... I, well, you said before that it's hard, and I know that that is obvious. It really you know is... That, that is what she said. <laughs> it's... <laughs> but there are so many panels about specific things that you need to work on. You know, like, I went to a panel called Boring Beginnings. And, you know, things to which avoid when you first of. start. And, you know, murky middles. Which I'm guilty of. You know, kick-ass endings. And, which I'm not guilty and, of. And, you know, you need good cover art, and you need tension, and you need subplots, and you need setups and payoffs. And, and you know, just there are all these different panels about a specific thing. You know, you need a, a catchy a log line or you know, an elevator pitch and all that stuff. A great blurb. And it just starts to be crippling <laughs> how many different things it says you need to work on. You know, how many different plates you're supposed to be spinning. And and so, you know, as far as you going, saying, you know, I haven't even written a novel yet. That's what you need to focus on. Is yeah. writing the novel. That is what I'm focused and, on right now. And I, Like I said, you know, all of these things are nice, but... Unfortunately, when I finally get around to <laughs> using the advice, it'll be forgotten because it'll be years down the line. And right now, writing is number one focus. But, you know, there's a certain author that we're always quoting, maybe not as much as we used to, but we still quote the guy. And, you know, his big thing is just put it out there and move on to the next thing and get better. And any criticism that you get, anything where you realize that it's weak, you work on that with your next project and you are always going on to the next project and you're just getting better and better and better. And I understand where he's coming from. That sounds like something, you know, it's just like, okay, people didn't like the ending or people didn't like the dialogue or people didn't like the female characters or people didn't like the sex scenes or people didn't like the cover or people didn't, you know, whatever thing people didn't like, it's instead of going back and saying, okay, do you like me now? I spent another three months on it. You, it uh, there were people talking on panels about fifth draft, sixth draft, seventh <laughs> drafts of their novel. And it just, holy cow, I, got, I felt like I was 10 years older every time they mentioned that kind of thing. Because to do another draft of a novel would take so long. And when they're talking about fifth, sixth, seventh drafts of a novel, we're talking about years working on the same project. And suddenly I'm agreeing with Dean Wesley Smith and saying, oh, just go on to the next one. Dude, there was a, a lady that was doing a panel, and she not only writes, but she publishes a novel every other month. And when I heard that, I was just like, oh, gosh, like all the saliva inside my mouth just <laughs> dried up. And I was just like, oh, 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 you know, in the same way as... Did she tell you how much money she makes, though? No, but who cares? I bet you More it than was me. a shitload. 
and then all the saliva would come right back and start drooling back out of your mouth. You'd be like, oh, yeah, I need to do that too. But I guess the point I'm trying to make there is this woman, I mean, unless she doesn't sleep, hasn't got the time to go through the novel again, and this is the third draft of this novel, and this is the fourth draft of this right. novel. It's like this, I wrote the novel, I got feedback on it, I incorporated that feedback, fixed all the typos, now it's out there, and I'm already halfway through, or a third of the way through, the next one. And that, to me, feels so much more healthy than the agonizing over the one or two or three things that I've written forever. And just like, I wrote this novel in eighth grade, and I, <laughs> it's still not where it needs to be, which you laugh but people totally do that, and you understand why they do that. It's their baby, and you know they, they want everything to be perfect. And, mm. you know, it's like if somebody read this novel and it wasn't perfect, then they'd never come back to me. I could understand having been that way early on, like when I was a younger person, and maybe I thought I was going to live forever, or maybe I just had, uh, you know, less life experience and didn't know what things would be like. But these days, I get enough ideas, and I have a huge cache of ideas standing by as well that I could never imagine spending that much time on anything. Just the amount of time it takes to actually write a novel, especially at the pace that I'm going. And right now, for February, I said, okay, 500 words a day. I picked an easily reachable goal, and I wanted to stick with that. You're not allowed to chew ice. I can't help it. On uh, the show. If, if I need to take away your cup from you, then I will. <laughs> I'm sure people will be wanting to strangle you if you keep it up. Uh, anyways. But yeah, yes, and I get enough ideas that sticking with something for a long time, I'm just like, oh, no. I finish it and move on. i got way too many more hanging by. You know, that's the, one of the reasons why I wrote the battle of ideas story is because yeah i'm like the guy in the story the guy was sort of based on me a guy who just has all these ideas that he's holding in his head and he needs to get them out and um yeah that's me i've got the ideas i don't need to continue to polish the turd until it sparkles you know i need to move on to the next one i couldn't be that person i would give up on writing before i spent 10 years or whatever working on the same book well hopefully you're over that hump because at the rate you're going melania trump is going to be president by the time <laughs> you publish it but oh yeah that's what i meant to finish the math 500 words a day i i had to work like 150 days to finish uh, a novel which was really daunting just at that pace i thought i got it I gotta kick it up a notch because I'm not gonna make it. No, no more chewing ice. Give me the cup. 150 days is nothing, though. Sure. You can have a huge bowel movement and get a new pair of pants, <laughs> and 150 days is gonna have passed. So even at that rate, I mean, if you think of how many 150s have passed since you started that, or if you first came up with the idea for that, yeah. even if it took you 150 days to finish the novel, that's still better than anything either of us have done. Sure, but so. I mean to kick it up a notch so that it doesn't take that long at all. Okay, well, I want you to stop it. Give it's me a cup of ice. Stop trying to chew it on the podcast. Well, I think we probably run out of time. Yeah, we're going to have to quit before you drive everyone away. Uh, one last thing before we go. This was one more unexpected boost or consequence or whatever you want to say of going to this panel or this conference uh, this weekend. It's the night that we went. I went home. I mean, it ended at like 6. So we had plenty of evening. I think we went and hung out for a while and had dinner, and then we both went home. And I think I got home by like 8. And uh, I sat around that evening, and you know, at one point I thought, you know what? I wonder how big a story collection of mine would be if I took all the stories I was willing to share and just piled them into one book. I want to see, and so I started going through it, and I just went through my folders, 
starting from all the way back in like the year 2000 and looking okay no i'm not going to share any of these these are probably not going to make the cut and moving forward and being okay here's one and i paste it into the the word file oh here's one paste it in paste it in and i kept going and going and by the time i was done i had 24 stories in this file and i checked the word count and it was 116,000 words yikes and i worked that out that came out to be like a 430 page book or something like that i totally have enough that i could easily put out a story collection and so i mentioned i mentioned this on facebook and i asked if people would be interested in buying it and several people said they would i don't know how much something like that would cost but i mean to put out a collection like a, a omnibus collection kind of like this one which has tons of stuff and then if you're not down with getting the biggie i think i'm going to put out several others that are smaller and uh, i'm really interested in putting out a paper version of the book a paperback that you can purchase i know that you can do print on demand through create space i think it's called on amazon i mean to work it out and get it going and just see how awesome i can make it and uh, i'm really excited and i've had a, a fairly good response to the uh opportunity so uh that's something i guess folks can look forward to this is hollywood big anklevich here talking that uh watch this space <laughs> for when you can buy my first collection of short stories it may be my last too because I'm, I'm meaning to transition to mainly novels from here so check it out folks there's going to be a few smaller collections or full-size collections you know whatever whatever fits into your budget i'll have a little something for you wow listen to that voice hollywood big signing out <sighs> and yes i too I, I, I don't know that I have the energy to summon California Rish, but <laughs> you challenged me years ago to put out collections of my stories, and I did put out an audio collection, and I've got another one ready to go. I need to put out any minute now, and it's kind of astounding when you look at it the same way that you did and realize, wow, I have enough for X number of collections or X number of pages, or in my case... X number of hours of audio and so that's kind of exciting if somebody's interested in those yes that's that's forthcoming for me all right so semi california rich and hollywood big have stuff ready for you folks it's the barstow california rich he's just you know, <laughs> yeah just he's, he is in california but it's not uh not really it's like lake tahoe rich right on the on the border <laughs> So uh, yeah, keep keep an eye out for that stuff because uh, it'll it'll be coming soon. And I'm even willing. I don't know how th that stuff works, but I'm totally willing to sign your book for you. <laughs> oh yeah, that's <laughs> I don't cool. know how that works and how I can how that can can be managed, but uh, I'll, I'll talk to some folks. I I know somebody uh, who has a book sitting in this car on my dashboard that might know a little something about that. So maybe I'll maybe I'll talk to that author. So I think that's it, folks. Uh, thanks for listening. I've been Hollywood Big Anklevich. And I'm Barstow California Rich Outfield. And uh, we'll see you in a few weeks with another That Gets My Goat. Yeah. Uh, sooner with the other shows. Make it happen. Why not? That's right. Dreams don't come true. Dreams are made true. That's it. Just no. Just dreams don't come true. Dreams don't come true. Kind That's the yourself. end of the saying. Darn and, it. That saying kind of sucks. <laughs> and lockers. Yes. That gets my goat is produced under a Creative Commons license. Why am I telling you this? Hi everybody. This is Big Anklevich. This is awesome. And he's going to talk like that the whole show, so you might as well turn it off now. No, um, no. <laughs> we should do it for like 10 seconds where I'm just talking like that, and then finally you're like, oh, you know, I think there might be something wrong with your microphone. <laughs> okay. Okay. I had one more thing that I wanted to say, and now I can't remember what it was. Was it about being editorially raped? No. Literarily raped? No, it was something Can we different. please?